Hello, I'm Joan. I'm a Canadian family physician who also works as a restorative medical educator, facilitator, and coach. I create spaces that rehumanize the work of healthcare. I'm creating this podcast to remind myself, as well as anyone else working in a helping profession, that when you are working and caring for your human patients, you are the other human in the room. Hey there, healthcare humans. Before we dive into this week's episode, I wanted to give you a quick reminder that um, Creating Space, my new coaching program and retreat, is going to be starting October 7th, 2024. So if you have been listening to the podcast for a while and really already making some changes in your life that help you rehumanize healthcare and you're ready for the next step, you're ready to be a part of a community of healthcare humans who are asking these same innovative system changing questions of what happens if I find a way for my version of healthcare to be human for me? How does that change the system as a whole? How can it feel better for my own life? Um, And you want to spend most Monday afternoons with me for the next six months, as well as a fabulous three-night retreat in April where we sink in even deeper and get to be in real-time community with each other. I would love for you to join me. There's a really amazing group of healthcare humans who have already signed up, but there is space for you. We're waiting for you. So what are you waiting for? Um, So in this podcast, you the show notes below, you'll be able to find the link or you can just go to joanchanmd.com slash space, book your call with me. We can make sure it's the right time for you, good fit for you. And um, let's get going. We're waiting for you to join us in creating space. And I'm so excited for you to book your call and see you there. Now on with the episode. Hello there, healthcare human. Thank you so much for coming back for another episode of The Other Human in the Room. I am super excited and intrigued for this conversation. Uh, This is my first time actually meeting this particular healthcare human, and she has one of the most interesting job titles, I have to say, that I've probably ever encountered, and especially in the space I'm interested in and um, how we can keep healthcare human and rehumanize healthcare. I really had to invite on someone who calls themselves a health futurist. And I think that's not even the full title, but that's part of how you call yourself, hey, Zaina. So um, would you like to introduce yourself for everyone on the podcast? Hello, Joan, and hi, listeners. Uh, Zaina Kayat here. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. And uh, yeah, I'm, a, I, I guess, an applied health futurist, so I don't applied. pontificate about the future, which I think is pretty easy to do, but more uh, with that understanding of the um, possible futures that might unfold that affect health care and health. Um, help, you know, help people like you, clinicians, organizations, systems, policymakers, companies make much smarter decisions and bets today so they can at least be uh, consistent with the evolving future. I love that applied health futurist. I just, yes, because anyone could just, you know, draw up a little diagram or make an idea, but what's actually going to impact what the future becomes you got to apply it right yeah that's really cool i think i um i would be curious how one becomes an applied health futurist like what is the path that took you to holding such a title i mean like any of us who are trying to you know i call us shift disturbers in uh in healthcare, (laughs) the way we want to approach um, protecting healthcare, creating the future of healthcare, whatever it is, humanizing healthcare. Um, the existing job descriptions and roles were designed to preserve the past. So we all self declare <laughs> our title based on the skill set and competency and passion we bring, just like you have. Uh, I think my last four jobs, I decided the job title. I've been an innovation Sherpa in chief, I was a chief <laughs> futurist. Um, so, so I kind of self-declared it in about January of this year of 2024, I decided to not work full-time for an organization uh, as my platform for making an impact, which has always been my, my way to 
have impact at scale was with a large complex organization. And so the brand, if you will, or the positioning as healthier futurist works really well because I can use that um, through multiple entry points now. And I've, you know, I do different types of gigs, if you will, uh, at many scales. Uh, and it's a unifying kind of job description if you, uh, that works uh, for any of those use cases that I'm involved in. We can get into some of them. Yeah, I, I would actually love to hear some examples of what an applied health futurist does with your day? Like what's the kinds of work that you're involved in? I mean, maybe I'll step back and it's linked to that answer. Um, if you think about in the healthcare world, quality improvement as an example of a competency and a set of infrastructure and a methodology to go from one state to some other state, in that case, you know, trying to match best practice guidelines or clinical guidelines when the quality is below them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that didn't exist as an infrastructure in, in healthcare period, let alone Canadian healthcare, right? Until Don Berwick and others formed, you know, some language methodology, an institute for it. Uh, and now every org has a chief quality officer and has quality improvement plans and at one point in Ontario, we had an entire agency of government that employed, I think, 100 plus people called Health Quality Ontario. So to me, you know, um, futurism is at the very early stages of being that next craft and competency that will be required of anyone who wants to do good, important work in healthcare, whether that's a clinician, uh, a CEO, a life sciences company, a policymaker. So... I've just one of the early ones, if you will, uh, you know, soon every, every org will have uh, in-house futurism capabilities of some sort. It'll be normal training in med school and in, you know, business school and blah, blah, blah. So in that context, uh, a lot of what I do, you know, is uh, helping leading orgs that are, know they need to go here, but they don't know where to start, figure out how they're going to embed futurism, futures thinking, there's lots of word for it, into their operating model, if you will. Uh, and there's many flavors that take. So that's one thing I do probably a third of my time. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of futures capacity building in complex health orgs or with individuals or you know groups of doctors or whatever. And then another third is kind of more keynote speaking like where there's just a huge uh, unsatiable appetite <laughs> in healthcare yeah. to understand the story about how the future is unfolding in a kind of con comprehensive but succinct engaging way that our brains can make sense of uh and so i do a lot of that to help again you know boards of directors or policy makers or you know i've done colleges of physicians and surgeons i've done quite a few of them so they can at least do whatever they're trying to do every day with a little bit more intelligence about is this consistent with the unfolding future is this against, the, you know, or or do we want to make choices that accelerate a future we prefer, you know, and help yes. that picture, you know? So, yeah. so that's about a third of my time. And then, and then another third is, um, you know, I kind of do like small contracts or retainers, if you will, uh, as a futurist in residence uh, with mm -hmm. a few orgs that they don't want me on a one-off, but a little bit more consistently, but not full-time. So I do that, for example, with Deloitte. And I've now got a couple of other contracts uh, that are more five or six months with some of the Canadian health systems. That all just sounds so cool. I love, yeah. Is it a good time? Are you having fun? It's the best. I get to hang out in the future all day, every day. Yes. Oh my goodness. I, I just think, I just find it really interesting, actually, what you just said about, I just am realizing, right, like QI and quality improvement Sometimes you enter a system, you know, like I was trained and I graduated and you think that the system you've entered is the system that's always been pretty much like, I mean, I was aware that at some point we use leeches and we don't anymore. So I know that healthcare like changed a little bit, but in terms of some of these things, they feel like they're the tenants They're That's what they're, what's always been. And therefore they must be what always is. And like things like QI training are a part of our curriculum now, but they probably aren't always, and they weren't before. I think there's an, an interesting tension with the notion of QI. Personally, I've experienced it. And, and I wonder what you would think. Like like you just said, a lot of times what 
QI is, is trying to see if you can get to what you think of as best practice. And the tricky thing about, I forget who I heard it from, but like best practice is past, past practice. So the notion that it's from evidence that's gone before and is actually still already outdated because another study came out the day after the guideline actually was published, et cetera. So there's something about you're trying to reinforce past and rapidly being outdated knowledge. It feels a bit in tension with a futuristic mindset. I'm I'm curious if you think that something like futurism would actually like replace QI or if there's still a role for something like QI or yeah, how those interact, you know? So I give a whole lecture. So I teach a course uh, in the uh, health MBA program at the Rotman School of Management at University of Toronto called Healthcare Innovation. So just kind of mm. unpacking what is this word innovation? What is it? What is it not? How do you do it? Blah, blah, blah. So one of my lectures is, you know, that quality improvement is not innovation. Uh, yeah. And so here's how I distinguish, right? It, you're going to go down a quality improvement methodology, which again, quality improvement says the standard of care that's been published from evidence says things should be like this, whatever this yeah. is, you know, a, a person with diabetes should get their A1C checked, whatever, four times a year, whatever. Yeah. That's the standard of care. Oh, but the data shows X percent of physicians in Canada, their patients are not getting the standard of care. They're not getting their A1C check, whatever. So you go through a quality improvement methodology to map out why isn't that happening and, you know, implement the changes to get back to the standard of care or, you know, guidelines, best practice, whatever you want to call as the bar. Innovation says, actually, that practice should no longer be happening. I don't want to improve that practice. It's actually yeah. no longer delivering results um, relative to an alternative practice that's completely orthogonal. Right. So I'll just give an example. Right. You know, for even monitoring. Well, I just did this the other day. I just turned 50 not that long ago. So I, I got the, the letters in the mail for three screening tests I need to do yeah. my pap smear, <laughs> my mammogram and my colonoscopy, uh, colon check, colon cancer check. And when I was doing um, well, the colon cancer check, you know, they allowed you to do it from home as the first screen, you know, poo on a stick kind of thing. OK. It was still the clunkiest process in the 21st it's century. So clunky. <laughs> so clunky, but whatever. Yeah. At least I didn't have to go through the other event of a colonoscopy. For the pap smear, you know, ages to make an appointment. You know, my doctor's on vacation, so I got another doctor. She's very young. She screwed up the pap smear. Let's just leave it at that. If something went wrong. The thing got stuck. Okay. So it was awful. And so, um, and so I said, you know, I work in medicine all over the world. The standard of care now is a self swab from home. Mm -hmm. And at least one of the province in Canada is doing this. So unless mammals are different, I don't, you know, <laughs> so that's yeah. to me what innovation was. So quality improvement would be like, oh, why didn't this 50 year old do her past smear? Oh, because we keep sending her letters in the mail and she doesn't respond <laughs> because she had an uncomfortable experience because, you know. The, you know, the patient doesn't feel safe going into the white people's doctors, you know, all these reasons mm -hmm. you can call it. Improve. But then innovation would say, no, we don't need to do a pap smear anymore. Right. We can get the outcome we want in a different way. So that's the difference. And then futurism, which is the next layer, like the crest is like quality improvement, then innovation, which I think we've matured, not quite yet in Canada. Futurism says, um, how might a bunch of vectors unfold based on trends, shifts, early signals that we're seeing? And therefore, are the investments we're making now in infrastructure, in maybe medical school curriculum redesign, which is a big investment, or the four or three that we're building in Canada right now, you know, yeah. do they make sense given where things are going? And that's a, a another layer of thinking and that's the space i'm now spending most of my time in so it's like one step removed where you're even thinking beyond what we might conceptualize as the current like the goal outcomes it's like thinking beyond that of like well i don't want to put words in your mouth so tell me if I, like but it's like yeah. beyond the, those outcomes like is there even a bigger picture way of looking at the whole thing do we need to be rethinking some of, some of the foundational ways we think we have to do healthcare in general. Yeah, I mean, 
if I had to summarize in an old lang- long range planning, if you will, yeah. right? it's just yeah. more of, but it just the speed and the velocity of certain vectors that change. They're unlike any we've had before for long range planning. Our long range planning in healthcare was basically demographics. Aging you know? population. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> et cetera. male, female splits, rural, yes. you know, uh, mm-hmm. immigration. Okay. Uh, poverty. Okay. But now like chat GPT, for example, is like this dislocation mm-hmm. that in six months, 25% of physicians were using it every day in practice in six months. You know, in Ontario, yeah. you doctors all have an agency of government paid for by taxpayers to help you use technology, you know, that you're spending a lot of money on <laughs> that you're still not really using well, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's the difference, though, now is the speed at which, and I think you mentioned things become out of date. In my world, we call it obsolesce. Like these mm. obsolescence cycles, they have never happened at this rate in medicine. And As you know, we are awful at displacing things that no longer serve. Yeah. Um, And so this becoming just how you work and you anticipate all the time. So I'll just give, you know, one example that I get involved in a lot is we know that about 70% of what is currently done in facilities, clinics, hospitals, pharmacies, lab clinics, doesn't need to happen in a facility. Place completely Mm. decoupled from good quality care or service. Yet, everyone I meet is building a new, whatever, hospital, medical school. (laughs) So that would be the kind of thing I would bring some intelligence to, to say, look at the trends, look at the signals, look at the data. Do you really Mm. wanna go on a hundred year capital investment? Do you really Mm. want to, you know? That's different from how do I deal with ER, you know, wait times and build another ER wing. Right. So what do you see then as the signals of, um, it makes sense to me that continuing to try and like catch up and build more physical places, like, oh my gosh, we're already so far behind if we're supposed to keep them all in the, the, the beds and in the, you know, and even not just the beds part, but like yeah. come into the office and do the thing. Like we already are so far behind. Yeah. Um, so what do you see as that alternative future that like some of these, these, especially rapid vectors are, are opening up for where think, care yeah. or yeah. Where is it going to be? There's two dominant paradigms that have locked us into um, infrastructure that's very static, yeah, expensive uh, yeah. and unable to meet the demands as demand of the population grows exponentially because the static infrastructure can only expand linearly, right? Mm, It's mm -hmm. additive. It's on a linear scale, but demand is on an exponential scale because of complexity, aging population, blah, blah, blah. Okay. The two infrastructure is facility-based care. The two uh, uh, dogmas, facility-based care. So that Mm -hmm. was based on kind of post-World War II when we built the infrastructure we have for healthcare that we had to centralize equipment, expertise, and it was a much more efficient way to deliver services to a lot of people, make them come to you, you Mm -hmm. know, because there wasn't an economical way to bring services to people. But that's also linked to another dogma, which is visit-based. The visit, Uh, which is mediated by a human who we timeshare, that human, and the top of the food chain that counts in federal law in Canada is a doctor. So their time sharing in a clinic for this visit, those are the two dominant paradigms that are completely unpacking and unbundling in the future of health. You don't need to be in a facility for good quality care or service. So like a diagnostic imaging, um, in uh, chemotherapy baffles me that we still mm. make sick people with cancer drive to academic medical centers to get chemo. It makes no sense in the 21st century. Mm. Uh, you know, dialysis, sometimes surgery, anyway, mm. anything. Uh, and it doesn't mean in the home necessarily, although a lot can be done in the, in the home. So, you know, we say from your waiting room to the living room, but it's just this concept of care anywhere, decentralized, 
much more um, things happening at the point of where the person is. And then this visit-based paradigm, which is around all the action of healthcare is mediated by a human in a time period called a visit, makes no sense. Really Given the matter. mix of needs people have, you know, you want to timeshare a human and do a visit, like an appointment, when it's a very, very specialized knowledge that mm -hmm. they can convey one-on-one. 99% -on -one. of healthcare doesn't need that. 99% of healthcare is people with complex illness that most of the magic happens when they're not touching a professional. <laughs> You know, uh, and, and, you know, and a lot can happen what we call asynchronously, not synchronously, yeah. but you can still have a, a professional mediating and advising, but it doesn't have to be the same time, let alone same place. Yeah. When you decouple place and you decouple time and then you decouple time and place, now you've opened up all that static infrastructure to much yeah. more dynamic. Yeah. That's the unfinished business at the basic level of healthcare let alone what's coming with AI and all these digital therapeutics that will replace mm. many modalities that are the standard of care today, like drugs, like medical devices, like surgery, you know, that's a whole other category. I'm just saying at the basics of what drives 90% of our spend in healthcare mm. is visit-based mm. care coupled to place. The thing that really excites me about what you're sharing is there is certainly a way in which like thinking of being able to decouple from that time share based place based also feels better to me as one of the people who was trained to do that yeah. because what I learned in my experience is there was a limit to how much I could do that without losing my mind and my happiness and like my body only had so much in me and there's others um beside me in the healthcare field whose bodies maybe have a higher capacity than I did or maybe they just have other things driving within them that are pushing them that much further where they're seeing their their time sharing all over yeah. the place but I just have this hypothesis that like maybe that's even just generally for humans we we often thrive when we have some well, sort of like how you're doing, like you're sharing, like even your job, like you've got some variety going on, you've got some things going on. For example, even like if it's not because it's fun, we as humans can get sick. We as humans may have people in our lives who get sick. And now suddenly, uh oh, I have to cancel a whole day's worth of income generating timeshares. And now it's, it's either I choose my health or my child's health or something, yeah. or I choose my income. And just um, that that feels um, pretty, I'll just like barbaric or something. Like it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel like the best use of anyone's time or energy. And it's inconsistent with, you know, there's a whole other vector of change on just the future of work. It's a whole area we yes. work on at Deloitte. So yeah. work itself, as we know, is going through a major redo in all of this. Everything you're talking about and what I just talked about is, is based on an industrial era, right? We're no longer... Yeah in the industrial era, we're in the solution economy or the knowledge economy, and yet we're still using industrial norms. Mm. You know, for you, it's basically FaceTime. I mean, like, you know, yes. like making people come to work that don't need to physically go to a place. It's the same idea. Well, th those days are over. So again, medicine is a little bit behind to catch up. And then I always add a 15 year tax in Canada to, to catch you. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and I think another part of it, what I hear, I work with a lot of mostly physicians and nurses, you know, who came into their profession for mission and purpose. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And they're like, I am not going to maximize mission by doing 15 visits a day or whatever it is, appointments yeah. a day. There's so much tacit knowledge I have. So let alone the, the drawbacks that you just described on just life. But yeah. so a lot are like, no, I can actually scale my expertise and impact way more people yes. uh, in other levers. And, you know, your podcast, Joan, is an example of that, right? Yeah. That also feeds your soul and your mission. So, yeah. so all of those is consistent with the pull towards, you know, emancipating from place and time as these constraints uh, yeah. and labor, frankly, like, the, you know, there's a whole unbundling and deconstruction of who is the expertise you need for different things. And we've locked mm -hmm. that into pretty static infrastructure as well with 
this construct from the industrial area called jobs, <laughs> jobs are done. Mm. There's no more saying docs can do this and nurses can do that <laughs> and pharmacists yeah. can do that. Those days are over. Mm -hmm. um, it's skills. It's, it's a stack of skills and an adaptive health workforce that can mix and match those yeah. skills. That's a lot of change coming to healthcare. It is. One thing I can imagine, I feel it a small bit in myself even right now, but it's it's a dying part of me. But also it's like how I was socialized and how lots of folks in healthcare may even currently be thinking as they listen. We're kind of socialized to be very protective of our roles. In fact, it's sort of part of the sales pitch, I'll say for physicians, whether it's conscious or subconscious, that's like, well, part of what you get when you put in all the effort and all of the abuse and all of the debt is that you get to be at the top of the food chain and dominate over everyone else. Um, and some people hold that more tightly emotionally and psychologically than others. Um, and even beyond like, hey, I want to keep my power. There's a, there's a whole thing even just about like identity that I I'm wondering, like, I don't know how much you get into say, like the psychology of change of like, what will happen to people if like, say tomorrow, suddenly someone snapped and like, there were literally no roles. I think a lot of people would be in serious like identity crisis because I built my whole world around this industrial specific way. Yep. There's like comfort or safety and predictability. And now we're in this new world where like, is there do you come across that as you share this and what are your ways of helping people ease that anxiety about the change? Yeah. So look, a lot of this is initiated by, you know, it could be at a health system level, regional health authority level, sometimes an org if mm -hmm. they're large enough, but they're the ones saying what we're doing today, we actually can't deliver mission. Yes. It's not working now. It's not working. And it never will. Like you said, do the math. It won't. So, yeah. um, Zaina, tell me, you know, where's the world going anyway? And then I explain all this and they're like, okay. So they actually decide to go on the journey of deconstructing jobs or future proofing, mm. future ready, whatever you want to call it. I'm not telling anybody what to do. I'm just preparing yeah. the information <laughs> and sharing a little bit of, you know, the beauty again of Canada being 15 to 25 years behind on a lot of things that are kind of the standard already in a lot of other jurisdictions is we already know how to do it. We're not, we're not paving new ground here. Okay. So yeah. we can learn from how did Netherlands, you know, make some of these transitions, what's going on with Israel, Singapore, blah, blah, blah. So that's a bit of my role is just like, you know, uh, confidence that this is the right path and evidence that there is, but absolutely, you know, I could in anywhere, like, you know, when, um, you know, when um, engines came out for cars, with carburetors and gasoline engine, you should have seen the horse and buggy and the saddle making industry, you know, hanging on for dear life to that um, yeah. way of life. And that means of income for people who, you know, tan the leather for the saddles or whatever, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, that could be the response to like a disruptor trying to come in and quickly add new value. By the way, patients always win in the future of health, always. But mm. somebody always loses. That's how it has to be. That's creative destruction. But when it comes from a system, it's a bit more planned and methodological, right? So mm. I don't think it's as sudden as, as you know, people feel no. like it can be. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding the pushback from a lot of clinicians in Canada about expanding scope of practice of pharmacists, these highly trained health professionals who uh, machines can now safely dispense pills. Thank you very much. You know, that they went mm -hmm. to university for four years uh, for. Um, but I, I think it's, we're going to need everybody to meet the needs of the population. So. Yeah. Cause like when I, like, I've thought a lot about like, well, what do we really need and, and I was thinking of it more in like, in how we're doing it now. It's like, well, we, we just need like way more people. So until they give us way more people doing the way we're doing it now, I'm choosing to, to do exactly how much I'm going to do to preserve myself and be a resource when I guess they bring in more people. But it, but this makes honestly more sense of like how it's actually going to go, where it's not going to be suddenly they clone us all. No, we have to adapt and find, and but and yet there will still be, 
many roles within such Nobody a Nobody ever, no one loses a job in the future of health. No one. Yeah. It's the most static, uh, or sorry, inelastic industry. It's inelastic right. to any market dynamics. Um, yeah. So the, it's just, like you said, though, but everyone, I think they've modeled 93 to 98% of every single role in, in medicine and in healthcare changes in the future of health, mm. every single role. So mm -hmm. that's a given, whether you're a ultrasound technician, a radiologist, a pharmacist, a nurse, a personal support, everybody's role changes, everybody. Yeah. So I think that's just, if you accept that, then it's just like, okay, how are we gonna do this? You know, yeah. at the end of the day, then the the beauty of healthcare, unlike anything else, is we have one North Star, the patient. Mm -hmm. Like as long as it's better for them, yeah, as the starting point, you move forward. And if it's not, it could be better for other people. It might be better for clinicians or the health system and save money, blah blah blah. But you know, it just needs a little bit more methodology. Um, yeah. This is not rocket science, mm. and we have no choice. One of the areas that I, speaking of kind of um, when I, I, I met you through a pod, another podcast that you were on and one of what, the things you were talking about is like, maybe it goes in this category of creative destruction or like challenging dogmas, ch ch challenging dogmas that are part of the past, like the whole timeshare thing we just talked about. Uh, and one of the other ones that you talked about that I would love to hear more of your thoughts about was like questioning if primary care was at the center of medicine. and. I know you know that I'm a family doctor and I and I don't feel defensive. I, it felt like a relief when you said <laughs> actually. Mm -hmm. I if you I would love to hear you expand more on if I've even said it correctly or like what it is that you're sort of yeah. challenging. Because you hear all the time, we just need to put more into primary care. Primary care is the center of it all. And we love you, primary care, except for when we say that, usually functionally what's happened so far is like not more money in terms of certainly not directly to me. Mm -hmm. um, and and then um, instead of lots more like um, the honor of more responsibilities and, and um, tasks and, um, you know, so uh, that's yeah, like been my really experience crazy. when I, yeah. Yeah. So I think great. we have to detach, first of all, like we use words, I think not everybody matches the meaning. So there's primary care and there's primary health care. Okay. Yes. True right. primary health care, the kind of textbook definition right, is your first line of, you know, uh, access for yeah. uh, proactive health, health promotion, your screening, your vaccines, mm -hmm. uh, proactively checking, you know, for at-risk group, blah, blah, blah. There's no reacting to symptoms. There's, right, right? there's no episode right. that's, just, you know, that should be about a quarter, right? Um, about a quarter should be uh, reacting to symptoms, which I think in Canada, we think is true, is primary care, not primary health care or primary health, mm. which is, oh, sore throat. Oh, you know, yeah. whatever. I'm going to make an appointment. Someone's going to do a diagnostic, maybe run some tests and then off goes either a treatment resolution or, the, you know, the next round of tests and investigations. Mm -hmm. That's supposed to be like a quarter you know, not a hundred percent. So I think that's <laughs> yeah. our distortion that we yes. think episodic reactive symptomology management is primary health care. It's mm. a piece of it, but it's not it. Uh, mm. Then the, th the other third is most demand for healthcare services, 85% plus, depending on the study, is complex illness, chronic illness, comorbid illness. It's not, you know, the mystery pain in the stomach that nobody can solve. Yes, there's yeah. that, but well, that does not need a visit-based relationship with one doctor. <laughs> that mm. needs a, you know, in the in business speak, we talk about a facilitated network. It's it's a community mm. of different types of help and support, some professional, some licensed, some not licensed, you know, whatever, you know, in the community. And a little bit of that might involve the primary healthcare person or team, but they don't own that. Um, yeah. especially not in a visit based appointment based paradigm, it's impossible. And then mm -hmm. the last quarter is the role of primary health care is to be that quarterback, that connector to all the other things. It's the gatekeeper for, you know, lab testing, yeah. writing prescriptions, ordering imaging, referring to specialists, like that's the other quarter. So that's primary health care. But 
if we're asking you docs to, you know, spend 99% of your time doing episodic reactive visit based care, well, you can't effectively do the other three. Yeah. Then at the same time, we're saying, oh, primary healthcare has to be the bedrock, the, the first line. Well, they don't match. So no. one of two things has to happen. Either we create a payment model and a care model that actually is true primary health care. And if that was the case, there's no way it'll be one doctor doing all of those things. It's going to be a team like everybody agrees we're in violent agreement. It's a team based model, but that's not how the the money moves. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, or you find alternatives that get the same job done. Yeah. In a good enough way, because if the alternative is no access to primary health care, let's go for good enough. How about that? Yeah. So that's kind of where where that those comments came from, that there are alternatives that are good enough that are getting the mm -hmm. job done. At least for bits and pieces. Right. And I think it would be interesting, like. Well, one one thing that. I would love to see, and maybe you know of models of how it's done, where it, like we stop having like the the monogamous relationship. Well, it's not monogamous; it's like polygamous, mm -hmm. um, but where um, but only in one direction, where mm -hmm. it's like I'm <laughs> I'm the husband, but I have many sister wives, mm -hmm. and they're all my patients. Mm -hmm. But my patients aren't allowed to be married to anyone else. Like the whole thing of where it's up to me. So again, so if I'm sick, if I want to take a vacation suddenly all my patients yeah. are like screwed. And even in the current model I'm in where I have hired a private nurse practitioner, so because I cannot abide that model anymore. And I am like polyamorously mm -hmm. introducing the second partner to my patients being like, look guys, she's great too. Still um, financially, like she can't bill. Like I, it's yeah. still all coming from my yeah. pocket. I'm not I'm not in any way financially incentivized. I'm de-incentivized yeah. from scaling or sharing or creating a team myself. Um, and I, I just think that is, uh, I mean, that just sort of illustrates how the systems as they are now are not thinking the way that you and I are thinking. Yeah. Um, I, I can imagine a feature because I do think like I really center the clinician experience, not because I think it's like more important than patients per se, but my belief is like if clinicians are having a positive experience in their work, and including potentially not just one job, but if they're having fulfilling, they feel like they are using their skill set, their passions in ways like that is then will create fabulous healthcare for patients. I agree. I totally you know? agree. I agree. And I, think, I yep. No, I want to hear what you had to say. Yeah, about that, no, I, I agree because, you know, happy clinicians make happy patients. That's just yeah. how it is. And that's, you know, so, and it's actually a much easier task to yes. create an incredible experience and conditions for the people, the carers. And, yes. then it, and then the halo effect is, hey, by the way, patients get awesome care, <laughs> the great experience without having to actually engineer it too much. <laughs> Thank you for the validation. Exactly. <laughs> and I can see, so like you say, yeah, those, like those four quadrants say those are like the things that I could even choose from like potentially different clinicians, whether they were trained as physicians or trained as nurse practitioners or trained or whatever, but like people who want to contribute to primary care, they may wish to actually personally contribute their time in different ratios, depending on what they're interested in or that sort of thing. And the idea that it's because they're not this one person has to deliver all these four things. And by the way, we only give you time and money to do one of those things, but like the demand, it doesn't yeah. even match. It just, it feels like a really delicious um, career to consider where you get to actually, all four of those things are the things that I certainly went into primary care for. And often what I hear people feeling distress about is, like you say, spending so much time reactive and actually like, maybe you would consider it one of the quadrants, but like a fifth quadrant that takes up a solid amount of my time is like um, giving people access to money from their insurance company. And I would prefer to actually- That's all that not... coordinating, referral, yeah. dealing with all the, all the, the glue at the boundaries yeah. of other parts. So that's right. all that fourth quadrant. Yeah. All yeah. I, so if you think I would it, love- Yeah, there's a body of work that needs to get done to achieve primary healthcare in the four buckets as one for Yeah. Me. Yeah. So then you'd say, okay, what mix of 
human, humans <laughs> who mm -hmm. are trained in something, capital, so equipment, do you need buildings, do you need beds, you know, um, and software, which is mm -hmm. zeros and ones. It's basically free. Uh, do I need to get that job done? And if you start there, you'd have a very different mix. So yes. in the proportion of that mix that is actual humans, right now it's like 99%. Um, and it's like this highly trained person called a medical doctor most of the time in parts of Canada, at least, <laughs> not in the rest of the world. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, that stack of human labor or human uh, service could be a mix of you know, and again, this adaptable health workforce, this new stack of skills could be a mix of sometimes someone like you, Joan, with your training, could be that nurse practitioner, could be a pharmacist, could be an occupational therapist. It depends, yeah. you know, the ability to flex, mm -hmm. uh, depending on who's around, <laughs> what that patient needs at that point in time, who they drive, whatever, you know, that's the work to be done. And that's yeah. what places are doing. Like, they're not sitting around like we're doing in Canada going, oh, we have a wait list. We have 6 million people without a family, without primary health care. Like, are you kidding me? Uh, yeah. They're just like, let's innovate now and find alternative models because mm -hmm. the constraint we have is too big to keep doing it the same way. But I just find in Canada, we just keep studying it and writing about it and talking about it and reporting on it. <laughs> and then patients keep waiting. What do you think is the difference? Like, so it, I would love to hear some examples of places that are doing it, both like what it looks like, because I think that's part of it is what you can't imagine that you can't contribute to creating. So I'd love to hear, yeah, like what is like, I don't know, one or two examples of how different places are innovating and, and was it, was it their culture? Was it, um, a, a stressor that made them innovate quicker or, you know what I mean? Like, how did they get there? I mean, this could be like a four day conference. My answer to this sure. question <laughs> um, just quickly. I mean, I lived for a year in the Netherlands with my husband, my three kids, and it just happened to be the year we were there. Uh, we all needed primary care and a bit of secondary care for different reasons. Um, no one is griping about primary care in the Netherlands. Like mm. it just kind of works. You know, if you got, you know, trained in the country and with which is heavily subsidized by government by the way to go to med school and mm -hmm. you want to you know get paid through publicly funded health care which is almost all of it in the netherlands it's just it's delivered and administered by private insurance it's publicly funded through taxes uh there are conditions under which you will get paid and there's a mm -hmm. care model that you have to be part of and if you don't want to then don't practice there go somewhere else you know so mm. any family uh, uh, family medicine physician, you know, is on a team. There's no single shingle practice. It just doesn't exist. There's a physiotherapist mm. on the team. X-rays in the clinic. Dentistry is there. You know, all that stuff. Mm. Labs. It's all in there. There. They have to work, be open 24-7. They have to be mm. available to patients 24-7. Um, and so if you can't work 24-7, then you figure out your shifts and every doc has to do one weekend every month. They just have to be on call. Like that's the mm -hmm. rule of the game, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they pay, you know, they're paid on salary. So it works. And my primary care, I remember she did stuff with me that in Canada would be right away a referral to a specialist. They're like, no, 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 we don't refer to specialists. Like they do the work. They mm -hmm. do IUDs and they do sutures and they do, mm -hmm. uh, you know, fixing your broken elbow that happened, you know, like they do secondary care, mm -hmm. you know? So that's one example. That's like not a tech focused one, but just it works. They don't complain about primary care. They complain about other things in their country, but not mm. primary care. I just give one other example. I gave a, a talk about this um, for McGill's primary care um, speaker series. So I work with Teladoc. Um, I used to be full-time, but now I'm an advisor. So it's a big virtual care company from the U S the presence in Canada. So to address the hundred million Americans who do not have access to primary care, not because it, like in Canada, it's not available. It's because it's not affordable. They affordable. have no payment yeah. model for it. Yeah. Uh, and so we developed a virtual first primary health 
care model, all four quadrants, tackling the unattached uh, American citizens, and it works brilliantly. When we mm. need a physical clinic, our clinicians will tap into a network, the odd time, mm. but it works. And why that one scaled really well with incredible results, we weren't undoing and taking away from anybody. Yes. Because people had nothing. Yeah. I would argue in Canada, when six and a half million Canadians don't have access to primary health care, yeah. somebody should be developing a model for that population. Mm. Mm. That's so interesting. I just feel like it's so funny. Even inside, I'm like, but what if I don't want to work once every one weekend a month? Actually, it doesn't sound too bad. Anyway, it's not like the, the version here would be the exact same, but yeah. I can, and it, it is, it's like the, the arguments that like I could see coming up are about ideas about quality or ideas about um, how things have been. Um, and the the thing I like about futuristic futurism thinking is like, I mean, part of the point is like the way we wish things could be aren't happening now. So like, sure, maybe it would happen. be, that's the thing. Like maybe happen. it would be super cool if like literally you could somehow clone and then every, per, like every single patient has their own family doctor and then they walk around hand in hand all day or something. Right. But like, we're like, that's the, uh, that's, no, that's we're really going to keep striking but... task force and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars of people's time to do yet another yeah. study, to do yet another yeah. report of what is the ideal state. And yeah. I would love the ideal state. Right. Right. It's not yeah. going to happen. This it is won't pragmatic. happen from a yeah. budget, from a resource, from a training, from a policy. It yeah. won't happen. So, yeah. So we can keep having timeless ideology mm. or just have timely access. Right. Totally. <laughs> and there are models. Yeah. And by the way, I don't even talk about technology. Like, so, you know, my jaw drops every day at yet another example of where a lot of the, you know, the stack of tasks, again, to do those four buckets mm. can be done by a machine, pretty easy, fast, safe, cheap, smart, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a great thing. Oh, yes, please. Um, Machines come help me. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, in a seamless way, of course. Not, uh, you know, I I can't, only in Canada do I hear docs talk about how tech is a burden. I'm like, what? Like, mm -hmm. you don't hear that anywhere else, honestly. Yes. I don't hear it mm -hmm. anywhere in the world, just here. Mm. Um, so it just tells me, like, the, the basic infrastructure or whatever is the, the organizing system, and they, you know, for primary care, particularly in Ontario, it is not, well, it doesn't exist. So let's- There you know, isn't a stop. unifying idea. Like, or organization or anything. So. No, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like the tech thing, I think um, like even just my personal experience with tech and I'm like early adopter, geeky, kind of interested in tech thing. Um, Like a lot of the tech that I've interacted with like EMRs and stuff are like trying to replicate what the paper version of it was doing. And, and then knitting together in ways where it ends up meaning that you're spending more time doing things that you you just know consciously, absolutely a robot can already do because your Gmail can already do it. <laughs> and that's yeah. like a kind of, it's not moral distress, but it's something. It, 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 it eats away at your soul as you click five times to try and do a thing. That, and that's why then people say, oh, if only I could just still scribble on a pad of paper. Yeah, and to me, my my like my opinion is that I, there is like there's the the issue with sort of mindsets of clinicians, and I'm a physician, so I'll say physicians in particular of like trying to have a more adaptive mindset and like trying things out and being a part, participating and trying to make it better. But also, it's like a failing of like the tech market here or something, and the yeah. restrictions of regulation. I'm actually not sure who is making it so clunky um but there's so many rules and and reasons things can't connect yeah. um so then people say i don't want to do anything on a computer which like i think the only way forward is with computers i think sure. a lot of that is a symptom of a broader disease in canada of this kind of enormous what i call technical debt you know mm. like we have not paid off the technical debt there are decisions that were not made well and things yeah. not implemented that, you know, we don't have some foundational pieces that don't allow 
us to participate fully in the digital yeah. world. Yes. Um, and that's what this, what you're describing, right? So yeah. like, we'll get there, but what a shame in this window right now that we're still f paying off debt. Yeah. Um, without getting to the principle, you know, so totally. that's what that is. And, you know, and again, I just think, um, you know, I, I generally I find in, in Canada, again, there are always pockets. I, I meet people like you that are the pockets, but there's just this real tolerance for mediocrity mm. and everyone's like, mm -hmm. Oh, we're risk averse. I'm like, no, no, no. Well, I don't think, you know, I think it's just, there's not this hungry restlessness to mm. just be excellent, push the boundaries, you know, mm. stay ahead of the curve for our patients. They're just, there's mm -hmm. not that hungriness anywhere at all the layers. It goes mm. all the way up to medical school, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see it in policy layers. I don't see it in admin. I don't see it in the leaders we elect to become big decision makers who control resources. It's just this endemic thing, which by the way, has been a secret to Canada's general success as a country. And it's not just healthcare, by the way. Um, mm. is, you know, we don't take risks. We stay low. We're very conservative. Yeah. Um, we have oligopolies. We, we tolerate mm. having five banks, three telcos, right. two pharmacies, like, and then what incentive do they have to keep fresh? Mm. We've, right? Like, so I think that's just a bit of a challenge. So it is really hard. So my, my advice is always put together your pieces that are going to give your life joy. Like you're doing joy. Yes. <laughs> you know, do your awesomeness there. Try to make a dent. Mm -hmm. But if we're going to sit around and wait for some whole system change to happen, it's just not going to happen. Oh my and gosh. Patients will pull us to the future mm. and they will find providers who will help them that might not help. be the traditional players. One thing I want to offer, um, which is like, I, it's about like defining the definitions, defining the definitions, but like definitions of term is I, I actually recently had an episode talking about mediocrity versus excellence, but in the way that um, at least physicians and other clinicians are like socialized to think about mediocrity versus excellence, which is not actually all the definition you just said. So I love like getting a new definition, like the definition that I feel like I got socialized to think of excellence was trying to meet the best practice standard as best I could, like trying to be as close, actually trying to be a hundred percent of the old way and, and perform all of those rules really well. And then, and I can't tolerate being mediocre at getting an A plus quality mm -hmm. report. And so actually some, it's interesting. Like I've actually, some of the episodes I've done about mediocrity have resonated where I'm like, be mediocre at following guidelines, be mediocre at, you, you know what I mean? So it's like, be mediocre at the old ways at traditional thinking. And actually in doing that, you are practicing your version of excellence, which is like excellence in future. So if people really want to be excellent at something, guess yeah. what? You've just given us like, You've we can now be excellent. At, yes. And I mean, it's not about like being perfect. The whole point is that we don't know what we're getting into, but like, Completely, and it's a, a moving target in real time all the time, yes. especially now when data is on the scene. Like we now actually will have intelligence about right. what's working and what's not working instead of waiting like eight months for some academics to do a study on eight-year-old data. Like mm. the cycles. So the cycles. you're kidding yourself if you think quality guidelines are going to ever be relevant, just like you said. And I mean, I think the area that's the tip of the spear I've been doing a lot of work in is cancer care because like- mm oncologists will say, if I don't follow the literature, sometimes hourly, mm. I can't give good care to my patients. Yes. <laughs> like that's how fast Intel is coming wow. in, you know? So that to me, that will be all of medicine and it is able to be. So I also, I have a provocative statement I say is, is if you're doing stuff to reinforce the current slash old way of doing things, i.e. meeting clinical practice guidelines, you're actually threatening the survival of our healthcare system. You're threatening the survival of our healthcare system. So take that. <laughs> Amen, sister. I think I, but I think that, and also like the survival of our souls as clinicians too. Like it, it's like both like truly. And then, I mean, we don't have time to get into then how do we educate the, <laughs> it's like, it, it comes from like how we, 
even start to how we even get into med school and on. So we're like, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? Please, dear God, tell me the right answer to pass the test. And then, yeah. but it, it is absolutely sort of this like subconscious insidious piece that is keeping us from thinking, like for seeing reality, like you're saying, like reality is that the knowledge we just had is gone and now there's new knowledge. So how do we keep up with that? It takes a different mindset, a different approach. But I'll just we, share it's more flexible for us. One normative scenario that, you know, again, not thinking is how it's going to be, but the signals and trends suggest we will go there is medical school will be maybe a year of classroom based something. You know, there are some practical, mm. physical, haptic things and uh, everything else will be at the point of care. You'll get your medical education when you need it at that moment because it's the only way. Yeah. Um, like that's like think of play that out. What does that mean for so many things? Well, because yeah. we have no methodology in this country to even explore this future, yeah. we're just going to keep building the same medical schools, you know, yep. over and over again. And oh, yeah. every student I meet, the med students are like, Zaina, I know everything I'm learning is out of date. I have to learn the real stuff on the side. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Like, I feel like I have to be like, here's the answer that's probably on the test. <laughs> and here's what I do, which is five different things, depending yeah. on the patient, yeah. depending on the context, but here's what the guideline, Yeah. here's what you should yeah. fill out in this form. And I'm just my, then my soul dies a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. So I just, I hope oh. we'll have more people who challenge that and then leaders yeah. who are fearless, who want to, you know, take on these difficult, you know, orthodoxies. Yeah. Um, well, um, I'm with you. Let's yeah. do it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's bust okay. Speaking of time, remember how I said I aim for 45 and then I yeah. have, I really forced myself. So it's almost yeah. an hour. Okay. Thank you so much. I clearly, I think I could hear you talk all day. Um, I like wrote down so many new terms. Like I love creative destruction. I'm like, yes, yeah, that's and well, that's shift book, disturbers. Right? Um, yeah. Eric Topol, who's a physician, a cardiologist, oh. has scripts. He wrote the creative destruction of medicine. Gosh, Ooh. 10 years ago, it's anticipated. everything we talked about, he already saw it coming. He wrote the book. Wow. And, uh, and he was like, uh, vilified by the medicine community. Now he's like, he was a hundred percent, right. Uh, hundred percent. Yeah. So, wow. Okay. Well, I will have to look up that book. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder, so, so understanding, you know, folks listening are there majority folks who work in healthcare. Some don't, but they just are interested in like how to stay human in their job as it exists now as well. And feeling those tensions of like, I can tell that the way this is all going, it feels bad to me as a human yeah. and parts, and maybe they felt some of the stuff that we've talked about resonates. It's like, oh, maybe that's why it feels bad. But also they have some of that internalized socialization of like, but I'm a good person only if I follow the right scripts. Like, um, yeah. what do you, what would what do you want to share in terms of words of encouragement or inspiration for folks to, to just make futurism feel a little safer to explore maybe like how is futurism going to help them actually help their lives feel a little better in their work? Um, so, I mean, I don't think it has to be fully futurism, even innovation, sure. which is just breaking up the old and putting it together in new ways for the new, you don't need to yeah. have futurist thinking for that. Like that's also a big gap in general in Canada. So, you know, I just think about maybe that, um, <clears throat> like I said, if you're not creating the new, um, you're reinforcing the past if your time isn't yeah. spent. So even I just say like if 10% of your time could be carved to just blow up that thing that you're trying to fit the mold of, and there mm. are mechanisms to use that 10%. That's one. And then the other language we use a lot is healthcare rebels. Mm -hmm. So this idea of a rebel used to be a bad thing, <laughs> mm. but, but you know, find your little army of healthcare rebels and they're out yeah. there and, yeah. uh, and, and it's very energy creating to be with peer rebels. And then, you know, mm. I would say a rebel, you know, basically really rocks the boat, but knows how to stay inside. Oh, you that's know? good. If you rock it too much and you're too much out there, the boat will tip and you're done. You've lost everybody. And yeah. And it's tricky in Canada because my God, the, machine wants the boat to never rock yes. um but you can find some waters yeah find some waters so i don't know that's what i say 
I've learned that you can create a podcast that does challenge some amount of dogmas and you don't immediately get kicked out. And I really, like when I started this, I was like, maybe someone's going to report me to the college. <laughs> like, like truly like the fear, there's so much fear-based yeah. like socialization. Oh, that's I a know. piece of don't rock the boat. Yeah. That it's, it's very liberating to move beyond. I will say that you don't have to create yeah. a podcast yourself, but something like yeah. that. But that's one mechanism. Others join yeah. and work with a startup as their little side hustle to just give them some energy and, mm. you know, mm. others teach like I do. And, you know, yeah. you know, others do an MBA. Like there's many ways you can, find your yeah. way. Um, but, uh, look, I have a ton of empathy, man. This is hard yeah. times. It's hard yeah. times and our patients are suffering. Oh yeah. And we are witness to it. So then, you know, like we were the ones who like literally are seeing it and feeling that distress. And so if nothing else, let's have that be fuel of like, I want to be doing something to alleviating this for them and for yeah. me. Like yeah, that's, to honor that's those the goal. Patients. Yeah, you know? totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time. If if people want to reach out to you, yeah. where are ways that they can um, like either follow you or reach out yeah. to you to connect? LinkedIn is the best. I'm on Twitter mm -hmm. as well. I'm not yet professionally on Instagram. I will be. Um, but LinkedIn, cool. I, my email address is there. People can con like the way you did. Yeah. Uh, but also Twitter. And then on LinkedIn, I'm always like when I'm speaking at events or if I'm whatever, teaching a course or what, you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I share that out loud. So that's a lot of way people then can find me in person too. Oh, Thank wonderful. You. So great. Yeah. Okay. Well, definitely please follow. And um, yeah, my invitation, my takeaway from our conversation that I'm like, I, I like to ask a question at the end. I like that. So like my invitation that's a spin on what you just said is what's the thing that you now realize is you feeling compelled to perpetuate the old and it's the thing you hate the most and how can this podcast be the invitation for you to blow it up and say we don't need to do that anymore and it and it, it won't be that you're being bad you're being creatively destructive you're being a healthcare rebel so like how do you want to do that this week because i'm going to think that for sure <laughs> i always say protect the future instead of protecting the past and oh boy, that's we so love protecting good. the past i know anyway. it's gone we can't go there <laughs> let's go towards what we're going towards anyway right yeah. thank you so much all right and everyone listening um talk to you next week I would love to take this work deeper with you. Visit joanchanmd.com today and discover my growing menu of options for restorative medical education to suit your learning needs. I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching, customized workshops, and self-study courses that allow you to connect not only with my work on a deeper level, but also with other healthcare humans just like you. So if you want to start humanizing your work and healthcare to a deeper level and do it in community with others, please visit joanchanmd.com and find those options and what fits you and your life today.